So you're starting to draft some fantasy teams and you want to make sure you're doing it right. Maybe you've watched some videos, did some mock drafts, but you still have questions. Well, I've drafted over 60 teams this summer and I have some strategies to share with you. Here are the top targets for every round of your draft. And in round one, I'm going to call out the name Cooper Cup, assuming you don't have like a top three pick where you can take a Jefferson or Jamar Chase. But after that, I'd seriously consider taking Cooper Cup definitely with a top five pick, maybe even with a top three pick. You can currently get him as the sixth or seventh player off the board look there's a lot of reasons why he's fallen a couple of spots after being a top two pick last year one of those reasons is that he ended up having season ending ankle surgery last year in november it was in week 10 he missed the final six or seven games of the year and some people are concerned about this but the good news is this injury wasn't severe sure it affected his season last year but as you can see from sports md analysis a doctor on twitter he says cooper cup should be at peak form by training camp so cooper is already 100 for 2023 three now let's address some of the other issues cup is 30 years old it's an age where receivers normally start to fall off that's assuming though that we've seen an efficiency drop in a previous year and for what it's worth he just turned 30 in june so he's a younger 30 for this season and even better we didn't see any efficiency drop from cup last year he was seventh in wide receiver efficiency fourth in targets per route in top 15 in yards after the catch and oh yeah cooper cup as you can see right here he led all wide receivers in fantasy points per game last year right ahead of Justin Jefferson and Tyree Kill. Now, another potential issue could be his quarterback, Matthew Stafford, who did miss time last year. Stafford missed the final five games of 2022. He had some combination of a concussion, but also a spinal cord bruise. Now, we have even more good news here. It seems like Cup is dodging all these concerns and bullets because Matthew Stafford, all three of his injuries from 2022, it includes that concussion and some other stuff, are fully healed. And this is a guy in Stafford who's only missed significant time twice in the past 12 years because he's normally playing through injury. And one more thing, Cooper Cup was the number one wide receiver in fantasy points per game, despite the Rams ranking 29th in plays per game, the lowest amount of plays they've ran in the Sean McVay era. Expect that to increase this year. So in round one, if you don't have a top two or three pick, target Cooper Cup. And if he's gone, you have a later pick, get Saquon Barkley. And then in round two, you want to target the Lions receiver, Amon Ross St. Brown. Now, Amon Ross currently goes as the 18th player off the board. And now I personally believe this is too late. I actually have Amon Ross as my 12th overall pick, as you can see in the fantasy blueprint right here making him a great second round pick. Now the emergence of Amon Ross St. Brown started his final six games of his rookie year where he averaged 25.2 fantasy points per game on 11.2 targets per game. Elite wide receiver one production. Now despite the success many people said oh but TJ Hawkinson and DeAndre Swift are injured that's why St. Brown popped off that much. But he went out in 2022 and put these doubts to rest. St. Brown had a 32% target share the third best in the NFL and he ranked second against man coverage. And check out this tweet from McNamara Dynasty. I'm on Raw. This is how good he was last year. He finished sixth in receptions and he only played in 16 games. So he missed one game and he actually left three other games early. Meaning that Amon Ross St. Brown finished 10th in fantasy points per game, even though three of those games he left early, skewing this sample. Because if you look at just his healthy games that he started and completed, St. Brown averaged 18.9 points on 10 and a half targets per game. And heading into 2023, he still has no competition. This is the wide receiver room for the Lions. I mean, their wide receiver two and three is Marvin Jones and Josh Reynolds. Jones is 33 years old and he was 77th in wide receiver efficiency last year and he's the biggest threat to St. Brown to start the year and then there's Josh Reynolds who if we look at his fantasy point per game rankings during his career the best finish that he's ever had is 65th averaging just eight points per game now of course at some point this year Jamison Williams will be involved but he suspended the first six games of 2023 so in round two take Amon Ross St. Brown and if he's gone target Tony Pollard then when you get to round three look for Brees Hall because he's the best third round pick right now he goes as the 28th overall player the running back 12 probably since Jonathan Taylor and there's even more similarities here Jonathan Taylor just like Brees Hall these guys were being compared to Saquon Barkley and Adrian Peterson coming out of college and he was also taken in the third or fourth round of fantasy drafts and in his rookie season Jonathan Taylor paid off that price tag finishing as the eighth overall running back with 16.9 points per game and now you slide over to Brees Hall who was also compared to Saquon Barkley coming out of college and his closest comparable best comparable according to player profiler is Jonathan Taylor himself and just like Taylor Taylor Hall was productive his rookie year last year. Every single one of his games that he played in seven games, he ended up having at least 10 fantasy points in. Hall was a top five running back as a starter in fantasy while it lasted. Because in week seven, after three carries for 72 yards and a touchdown, another promising performance was on the horizon while he tore his ACL and missed the rest of the season. But the current reports are that he's going to be 100% healthy and ready to go for week one. He'll probably be ready at some point in August. So take him in round three, and if he's gone, target Josh Allen. Then in round four, look for 
for Joe Mixon. Look, the value on Joe Mixon is quickly drying up. You were able to get him in like the fifth to seventh rounds earlier this summer, but there's still value on him as a late fourth round pick. He goes as the 46th overall player, the running back 18 right now. It has been an up and down off season for Mixon, and it still is. We'll dive all into this, but it started in like February because once the season ended, there was concerns that the Bengals could just cut Mixon. As Joe Goodberry says right here, they could save $10 million against the cap if they just cut him and sign somebody else in free agency or get somebody in the draft. But once free agency came around, the complete opposite happened. The Bengals didn't sign anybody of note, and they actually let their reliable backup in Samaji P. Ryan walk and sign with the Denver Broncos. And then in the NFL draft, the Bengals didn't spend significant draft capital on a running back. It wasn't until the 29th pick in round five, so a late fifth round pick where they took Illinois running back Chase Brown. And look, there's no doubt about it that Chase Brown is an athlete, and he's a producer. He was fifth in this class in running back athleticism. But the truth is, he didn't secure strong enough draft capital to be somebody that's going to push Joe Mixon. Now, Mixon still has some hurdles to clear before the 2023 season starts. Because in the spring, he was recharged for a January incident where he waved a gun at a motorist, and he is set for pre-trial as this is being recorded on June 29th. Now, early indications and support from the team suggests that he's not going to miss significant time, if any at all. But another hurdle would be that the Bengals want Mixon to take a pay cut. You see, his current contract is four years for $48 million. And this year, he's due about $12.6 million, and they want to get that number to around $10 million. Now, the good news for the fantasy industry is that Joe Mixon will probably take that pay cut because the running back free agent market isn't that great. He'd make $10 million by staying with the Bengals, and compared to what the running back free agents, the top ones got this offseason, Miles Sanders was the highest paid guy, got just $6.4 million a year. David Montgomery, $6 million million dollars a year and then after that Jamal Williams a four million dollars a year it's not a good market so odds are Mixon is a week one starter for the Bengals he wasn't all that efficient last year but he still saw success he earned 60 receptions top five amongst running backs and 1300 total yards last year and as a quick reminder to what his upside is in this offense as legit football on Twitter points out here Mixon was the only player in fantasy to register a 50 point game last year so grab him in round four if he's gone target Aaron Jones and then once you get to round five look for the Packers wide receiver Christian Watson Watson goes around the 60th player off the board later in round five as the wide receiver 28. He's the best fifth round pick. Now look, there's some early reports floating out there that right now in camp, Jordan Love is targeting Romeo Dobbs as his guy. I don't buy this because as you can see from my tweet here, the exact same thing was happening in camp last year. It was all the highlights and all the talk about how Aaron Rodgers and Romeo Dobbs were a clear, great fit. And what happens? Dobbs finishes 64th in wide receiver points per game. So don't fall for the early camp reports when it's only been a week of these guys playing together and Watson is the clear and better athlete which was shown last year and what many people don't remember is Watson dealt with injuries before the season and during the season and then really at bad times in rookie minicamp in June he has a knee surgery a minor knee surgery and then in September to start the year he has a hamstring injury that lingered for a few weeks it's already an uphill battle for a rookie to get caught up to speed on the NFL and he had another setback but oh man once this man broke out he didn't look back in week 10 when he was finally healthy he had his full snaps back after the hamstring injury he puts up 36 points on eight targets against the Cowboys and from week 10 on he was fantastic Watson was the number seven wide receiver in fantasy and led all players in fantasy points per target now despite this he goes as the wide receiver 28 in drafts because his new quarterback is Jordan Love but this is far too late the market is weighing Jordan Love being the quarterback too heavily they're like assuming Love's going to be a bottom three quarterback what happens if he's just a bottom 10 quarterback or heck even a league average QB and honestly the information we have suggests that he's probably closer to league average than the worst quarterback in the league he's a former first round pick he has a big arm and mobility and he was efficient in limited regular season and preseason appearances. So simply put, target Watson in round five. And if he's gone, look for Jerry Judy. And then in round six, look for Chris Goblin. Because believe it or not, I actually have Chris Goblin as my 48th overall player. That means he's a fourth round value according to the fantasy blueprint, which you can join thousands of other people who have access to this blueprint, a whole lot of more tools than just this. Link down below. Look, I get it. Tom Brady is gone and Baker Mayfield's now the quarterback. That's why he's dropping down draft boards. But it makes me question this because a guy like Drake London goes in the fourth round with his quarterback being Desmond Ritter in a run first offense. Why does he go two rounds earlier than Goblin? And look, Baker Mayfield did indeed struggle last year, but he didn't really have much help. The Rams pass blocking ranked 24th in the NFL, and in some metrics, they were bottom three. So it's strictly the quarterback situation that's dropping Goblin in drafts because it's not his talent. Because Goblin was top 25 in PFF grades last year, earned the 10th most targets, and was still efficient after the catch. And look, Baker might actually be a good fit for Goblin because he loves slot receivers. You remember this guy, Jarvis Landry, who as of this recording is still a free agent? Well, Baker's first two years in the league, Baker Baker as a rookie and a second year player produced a top 25 season and a top 20 season 21st overall we can call it for Jarvis Landry the slot receiver who is nowhere near as talented as Chris Goblin is. Baker's slot wide receivers average over four more points per game than his outside receivers and Chris Goblin led the entire NFL in 
touchdown slot receptions last year. So when it comes to round six, take Chris Godwin. And if he's gone, target Christian Kirk. Then in round seven, there's really only one name you want to target. That's Deontay Johnson. Because he goes as the 75th overall player, the wide receiver 33 in round seven. But I actually have a fifth round grade on him. And honestly, an early fifth round grade. My 52nd overall player, I am about two rounds ahead of the market. And what I'm most confused about is how guys like Brandon Ayuk and Michael Pittman go significantly like a round ahead of Deontay Johnson. Because Pittman's efficiency last year hit a career low, 53rd in wide receiver efficiency, even though he had the 10th most accurate targets. And now he's going to have to play with an inefficient QB. Anthony Richardson in college as a passer ranked 143rd in overall accuracy. And then there's Brandon Ayuk, who averaged 25% less points when Debo Samuel was actually active last year. And now Debo's going to start this year healthy. And look, this is just a loaded roster in terms of wide receivers. Debo's there. Obviously, the running back position, you have not just McCaffrey, but Elijah Mitchell, if anything happened to McCaffrey, both great. If we scroll down to tight end, oh, old reliable George Kittle. I mean, this is a really difficult offense to see success for Ayuk in. And success is all relative. This is relative to Deontay Johnson going around to around and a half later. Because look, Deontay is still just 26 years old. The man is in his prime. And he's coming off of a 147 target year. He has 140 plus targets in three straight seasons, only one of three wide receivers to do that. And plenty of things were great for Deontay in 2022. He was number seven in wide receiver usage. He was top 20 at earning targets per route, and he was 10th versus man coverage. Look, it was just an unlucky season for Deontay. He somehow scored zero touchdowns on 147 targets. Similar volume receivers the last 20 years averaged six to seven touchdowns, and he had a career low in yards after the catch. Expect both of these to increase this year while the volume stays relatively high. Take him, or if he's gone, James Conner in round seven. Now, this round eight player, I believe, has top 10 upside, but goes in round eight. But before we get there, if you want to win your fantasy league and beat your buddies, well, check out the fantasy blueprint because it's for you. We've referenced it a couple of times in this video. It has all the tools and analysis you need to win your league, and it's just $5 for the entire year. And if you don't make your fantasy playoffs, I'll just refund that $5. It's not just for the pre-draft process. It helps you every single week of the year, all the way up and throughout January, which means it breaks down to like 10 cents per week. And you can get it right now, joining the thousands of others who are already using it with the link in the description below and just following the two simple steps. All right, now that guy in round eight with top 10 upside is Chiefs wide receiver Kadarius Tony. And I already know what people are saying. Oh, he's burnt me in the past. He's always injured. Yeah, you're right. He's only played in 19 games his first two years, meaning that he's missed 44% of his games due to injury or maybe even like holding out so he can get traded from the Giants. And just for what it's worth, that was a smart move because now he's a Super Bowl champion and the number one receiver for Patrick Mahomes. Look, all the reports are positive right now. Matt Nagy, the new offensive coordinator with Eric Bieniemy gone, says that there's a nice relationship being built between Tony and Mahomes. That's good. And then Chiefs head coach Andy Reid is praising Kadarius Tony's attitude this year since being traded from the Giants and now being the number one receiver for the Chiefs. And it's not just the coach's quotes that show confidence. It's what they're doing with their money, their dinero. Because they didn't add any other significant wide receivers in free agency. And the only guy they really added was second round wide receiver Rashi Rice out of SMU. And here's some quick notes on Rice. He has solid size and speed and he produced over 1,300 yards last year, but his ability to separate is a concern. Look, Rice is probably a fine pick where he currently goes, but he's nowhere near the talent of Kadarius Tony. Because in the 56% of his games where he's managed to stay healthy, he earns a target on 29% of his routes, which is top 10 amongst wide receivers the last two years. I expect Tony to play around 60% of the snaps, but if he could somehow take an 80 to 90% snap roll, he'll be a top 15 receiver. So take him in round eight if he's there. Otherwise, take David Montgomery. Now in round nine, you want to target this guy as of this recording, and that would be Samaji Piran. He's slowly rising. He's gone from a 10th round pick earlier this summer to a 9th round pick, but he's still a value as the running back 37 in drafts. Because if you are not aware, he is the number one running back currently for the Denver Broncos. And that would be because Javante Williams tore his ACL last year, and he actually tore multiple ligaments. It's a complicated injury to return from. And look, you might see some reports out there that are positive for Javante, maybe even playing week one. Like, look, he's limited in OTAs. Well, he took no contact. He wasn't cutting. He was just basically out there. Just be weary on camp reports about injuries because they're usually going to just lean positive because why would a coach say something negative? Now, last year, there was a guy in J.K. Dobbins with a very similar injury to Javante Williams. And Ian Rappaport was saying he's not going to be able to start week one. And J.K. Dobbins requoted that and said, hey, I'll be out there ready to go week one. Damn sure going to be ready to go week one was the exact quote. And what happened? Well, he wasn't out there week one. He wasn't even out there week two. He missed the first two weeks of the season recovering from his ACL. And Dobbins actually came back in record time from a multi-ligament injury. He came back in like 13 months instead of 15. But he paid the ultimate price coming back early because he missed those two games to start the year. But then he missed seven more total games because of that ACL surgery and a setback. So it's pretty likely based on his injury that Javante is going to miss at least a couple weeks, probably closer to four to six weeks, which means that Samaji Piran is the clear starter. And in three starts last year for the Bengals, he averaged 100 
110 total yards on 21 touches. So take P. Ryan in round nine, and if he's gone, target a tight end and Pat Fryermuth. Now in round 10, if you didn't get Josh Allen earlier, let's start to target Geno Smith, who quietly won the offseason. And he won the offseason for multiple reasons. First, he got more weapons. Jackson Smith and Jigba thought to be the best receiver in the draft. They took him in the first round, and they took a second round pass catching running back. He's an athletic guy in Zach Charbonnet. And then the other reason why he won the offseason, well, he got paid. He finally got paid his first big contract. Three years, 75 million worth up to 105 million with incentives. Now, despite the confidence in the money that they gave him and getting more weapons, he goes as the quarterback 15 in drafts, which is a bit odd because last year he finished as a top five quarterback in fantasy point scoring. The only guys who go ahead of him now go in like round three or four in fantasy drafts in Mahomes, Josh Allen, Hurts, and Burrow. And now heading into this year, he has an offense that is just absolutely loaded because he has three legit wide receivers in DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, and Jackson Smith, Najigba, which means in two wide receiver sets, they'll be good. And now they're incentivized to use three wide receiver sets more, which means more passing and passing in the red zone for Geno Smith. So target Geno in round 10. Now, if you already have Josh Allen from earlier or Geno is gone, target Rashad Bateman. These are the top targets for every round of your draft. But if you want to see the top 10 must have players for 2023 overall in drafts, well, check out this video right here. And if you are not already, take two seconds of your time to make sure you're subscribed so you can stay up to date on all the latest info you need to win your league.